Welcome to This Academic Life, Episode 69. This episode is sponsored by the School of Engineering at RPI. Did you know that it was a chemical engineer from RPI, Mr. Howard Iserman, who invented the sunscreen? So next time when you go out on the beach, think about RPI chemical engineers who have been keeping you safe. Hi, my name is Kim Michelle Lewis. I'm a professor of physics and associate dean of research. Hi, my name is Pani Anuel. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering. Hi, my name is Lucy Zhang. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering. Recently, I came across this article that's published on Science Career section, where a professor, a principal investigator of his research lab, found out that his postdoc committed fraud in a research publication that had his name on it. He shared his experience and all the ordeal that he had to go through in order to fix the problem. After reading that article, I thought about you know, how often we have witnessed the research fraud that's happening around us. Today, we can talk about the things that we have witnessed and how we can put in our best practices in order to avoid such thing happening around us. So a quick Google search in looking at the definitions of research fraud come with the following definitions, falsification, fabrication, and plagiarism of data, data results that people just simply made up. And in terms of research, it also involves incorrectly attributing authorship, gifting authorship, uh, things that you didn't really do uh, that you're giving credit for, and also manipulating research materials, equipment, or process. Basically, anything that you're in intentionally making up or omitting. I know that we've all heard lots of stories that are happening around us in related to research. Any stories you want to share? Yeah, I can start. I remember when I was in grad school, there was this big, big news about a PhD who was working as an industry and somebody went and read the dissertation and they found out that there was some evidence of plagiarism and then it became a huge huge news that his diploma was taken away from him his advisor at the time also was in trouble as well as the dean of the college and i remember that within my uh, department and my research group there was a lot of emphasis talking about what's plagiarism and how we need to do referencing and that was the first time that i heard that even if you publish something that you are the first author and then you use your own sentence in another paper that's an act of plagiarism and I didn't know that I thought that that's my word <laughs> and uh, it had a huge impact many many years after that guy he got his PhD he lost his degree because of that act and I don't know if it was intentional or it was unintentional um I guess I don't really have any stories but I do remember in graduate school just having a fear of ensuring that I won't do it, whether it's referencing journals or coming up with something. I, I just was always very fearful. Even when um, I did my U.S. patent, I spent so much time doing literature searches to the point where the lawyers was like, Kim, you, you've been spending months and months checking all of this stuff. Like it's not there. I just felt I was in graduate school. I was really paranoid about it, uh, very much so. I feel like paranoid is the way to go to avoid situations like this. I mean, comparing to 20 years ago when we got our degree to now, there have been way more resources available on the internet comparing to back then. When I was doing my PhD, a lot of times we simply just go to the library and, and look for and read those papers right there. And by most, you photocopy some pages and that's it. 
So nowadays, everything is online, and it's much, much easier to have access to information that we didn't have before. My first time hearing about it is actually through my dad. My dad has a PhD in mechanical engineering, and so he told me that during his graduate study. So by then, he already published quite quite a lot of papers. And and by the way, thirty. Forty years ago, publishing a paper is very, very difficult. <laughs> it's like getting a grant nowadays. And one day, he came home and then said, "I found a copy of thesis." So this person literally made a copy of it and cut the figures <laughs> onto his thesis, like literal copy and paste. <laughs> so. There were a few figures.、Uh, there are key figures for that thesis, and they were on his papers that were already published. Because back then you don't really see that often. Because again, it's hard to have access to other people's work. You ha- actually have to go and make photocopies of them and and paste them. So he came home. He was like. He didn't know what to do. He was angry. He's like, "Well, if someone can write a PhD thesis out of my papers, I should be getting a thesis, <laughs> right?" So it's 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 my work. But anyway, that was the first time I've heard、uh, such a thing that people could do that, and then it happens around you. And I don't think he knew what to do. And honestly,、uh, I think back then it was just very little、uh, amount of access for you to. To follow up on something like that, with my own experiences, I think I might have mentioned this in one of our other episodes. A colleague and I wrote proposals together, and then I later happened to be a reviewer of a paper that he authored, and I've noticed there were the the way it was written looked very familiar. I'm like, oh, this person writes like me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized that when I was as I was reading,、uh, reviewing this paper, I went back to that proposal because there were copy, direct copies, paragraphs of my own writing. So I'm like, this this looked too familiar. So I went back to that proposal. I'm like, wow, this person literally copied and pasted my entire introduction of the proposal. As the introduction to the paper, what can you do in that situation? Because I'm supposed to be an anonymous reviewer, but I I recognize my own writing. <laughs> so so how do you keep yourself anonymous in that case if you confront the person?、Um, the short version of the story is I did anyway, and I don't really know what happened to that paper. Eventually, I think it did get published somewhere. Eventually, probably not the version that I reviewed. You can see that we all experience it in so many different ways near us, nearby us. So it just happens so frequently than you can imagine. Yeah, and also you mentioned that falsify. Seeing the data, I listened to a nature podcast, <laughs> and they were talking about that. What a big problem that is in the medicine and health, because people they are producing this data, and they are saying, "Oh, this drug is the best thing for whatever." But those causing people's life, and、uh, in in engineering, like if it's a like a basic small theoretical paper, it's the damage is not that bad. When you are dealing with humans' life, it's, it's very dangerous. And they were talking about this guy that his job is like being a detective, going through these papers that being published by very high impact journals, and then trying to prove that these are not real data. But、uh, also, you were mentioning that you,、uh, you saw your own writing. I, I I I recently also heard that one of my colleagues working with another colleague, and、uh, and they wrote、uh, this proposal together. It went through the review process, but then the part. Partner said that well, I'm I'm gonna resubmit it as my own work and very proudly talking about it because 
And in their mind, there was nothing wrong about it. And they said that, well, I just maybe I'll take your part out of it. I think that the research integrity is beyond falsifying data or using your own words. And it's a combination of ethics and how far you go with copying one sentence or the entire proposal. Right. So it can be, if it's just really just one sentence, and hopefully that's your own sentence. It's probably not going to be so consequential in terms of exchanging ideas or presenting your data, but significant amount can be quite detrimental. It can go from simply being asked to withdraw your paper if it's a paper publication. Some severe ones I've heard, it can really ruin your career, not just reputation, but could ruin your career. Do you think that we see more of it now as a result of people wanting to be promoted to the next academic um, rank? Or do you think it's just more prevalent now just because we have more technology at our hands to run articles through a database to see if there's copying and pasting? That's a great question. I think it, it could be a combination of both. Like I mentioned, my dad's case, that's many years ago. And it was already happening uh, around him. So you can just extrapolate if a certain number of people experience how many people are actually uh, committing fraud uh, near him. And I, I do believe that the pressure uh, around nowadays in terms of quantity will sacrifice quality over quantity as a result. If you don't have a good ethics bound then you can go very far. And then I'm assuming that people also, once they get away, it's like thieves. So you get away with it once, you feel like, oh, you're gaining the system. You're gaining. And then you can do it again. And the second time you get away, you just keep on doing it until, <laughs> until it's out of hand. And, and I, I do believe that certainly, it's same thing with proposals because money funding amount is part of the measuring matrix. People need to get it out. People need to write as many as possible in order to get a chance of getting funded. So proposals is the same thing. Uh, plagiarism within just proposals. I, I, we, we heard the case that Panya was talking about. That's also seemed to be out of control. And I know some funding agencies do check if they do do their diligence, um, but of course, the, the time is limited, but proposals that do go in, there is a way to check whether it's been submitted before and how much overlap there is. There are tools available to uh, funding agencies for our school, like we have Blackboards, uh, when they submit a paper or a report, uh, there's similarity check based on the database that's been accumulated before that's, you know, that's been submitted before. So there's similarity check on whether it was copied from previous years, for example, or from online resources. Things are starting to, there are tools available for us to do that. It's just that you have to be very diligent in order uh, to do it, to use them. Do you know if there are any legal consequences? Uh, have you seen any cases like that where people getting sued as a result? If, if that relates to research uh, fraud could lead to legal consequences. I haven't seen any, but I've read some uh, that happened in US and also in Europe. In one case, there was it was interesting that... One person published a very high impact paper and then translated that to their own language and then published it in another journal. <laughs> and it's kind of like, so it wasn't any novelty in the work, but just the translation. And I thought that, wow, <laughs> it's like, I, I never thought of that. <laughs> uh, then also I read that some faculty 
in, in, in summer schools, they there have been some lawsuits against them because of the different uh, type of, I guess, research misconduct. It can ruin uh, your career. Uh, going through those lawsuits, even if if uh, if it was false and then at the end you win and the somebody whoever was accusing you of research misconduct they lose their case still the damage in my opinion is kind of done it's very difficult for normal people to to come out of it still strong maybe if you are very very high profile person maybe you can survive but not most people, they can survive this kind of uh, misconduct. And that's why I emphasize, I tell my students a lot every semester at the beginning, what is uh, the research misconduct? What are the act of plagiarism? What are the, like, I didn't know self plagiarism exists. And when you need to use the quotation mark, how you do the, like even paraphrasing, you need to still reference the original writers. And some people, they are questioning that if you are reading a paper, do you read that paper or uh, do you cite that paper or you cite the original papers that they were referencing? So all these things, they become so complex and then we all become kind of paranoid. And there are many of these acts, in my opinion, it might happen unintentionally. People, they just don't know. So we just need to be kind of paranoid and double check our work and hopefully we survive. Oh. So one thing that um, I learned when I was in grad school, and I guess it's a question first, wondering if this is considered plagiarism. I, I think it is, but I'm not sure. But I see more and more often students cutting and pasting figures that they find on the internet. So let's just say I am I do uh, atomic force microscopy. And let's say there's a fancy figure of an AFM that someone drew using PowerPoint. And the student finds it, and then they... Boom, they just cut and paste it, put it in their presentation to use it to explain how an AFM works. I'm looking at the PowerPoint slide and I'm like, hey, did you draw that? And they will say, no. And I will tell them, okay, well, you need to uh, say where you got that picture from. And they say, well, it's weird to put a web link. And I will tell them that they need to go ahead and put the hyperlink about where they found that picture. And I was taught by my grad advisor that you should do that. Like, so if you take a picture from somewhere and you didn't draw it, you must put the link. So a lot of students don't do that. They think, oh, it's out there on the web. Anybody can snatch it and pull it down. And so I also think in my mind, that's a form of plagiarism. And I just wanted to know if you guys also feel the same way. You did not draw the instrument of you did not draw this particular figure, then you need to let the audience know or the readers know where you got that picture from. And I remember in the same note, there was a particular data set that was published in the paper. And the journal gave very clear guidelines about if you want to show results from another paper in your paper, you literally have to ask the other author and publishing journal for permission and you have to get it documented. And then you have to put that in the references, like I received permission. And then even in the caption of the image, you have to say uh, permission by the blah, blah, blah. So interesting that these people can plagiarize because there's actually guidelines, like you actually don't, you could just get permission to use it. But I guess the point is they don't want to get permission to use it because they want to pass it off as theirs. But I remember in graduate school learning about how to properly do these things. And as a graduate student, it's pretty scary to email this very famous uh, scientist and say, hey, you know, that's a really good um, you know, graph. Can I use it in my thesis or can I use it here? and wait for their response and then ask the, the, you know, the publisher, can you use it? But I think the publishing companies do a very good job outlining how to get permission if you want to do it the right way. So it's not like it's a black box where you don't know how to get it done if you really want to do it the right way. Yeah, actually, I tell my students that they need to redraw every figure, even if it's 
remotely inspired by some other people's work and they need to reference that work, the original work. And and also, I think that nowadays the journals, they make it super easy because you fill out the form and then, you know, you get the automatic permission. So I think that it's very important that we all learn to be mindful of not get involved in this unethical acts. Agreed. So coming from that story that I shared at the beginning, what are some best practices that we can do as PIs from this happening in our own research groups? I think just sharing your stories and tell them that the consequences and uh, it's not worth it. At the end of the day, it's like it's better just you are a graduate student for three, four, five years and just work with integrity and just be honest and then present your work. How hard it is to redraw and rewrite the sentence and how hard it is to cite somebody's work. But as I Again, I think that many of this is unintentional too. These days, the student, they use chat GPT like it's like how we were using calculator. <laughs> it's everything. And, and many of them, maybe they don't know that it's so clear and so obvious that's not their writing and they can easily get in trouble. Uh, but just educating them. Also, educating them on a regular basis and uh, also us being up to date on the tools that they are available to to prevent this from happening. I think having a conversation with the graduate students the moment they enter the research group is important and maybe doing refreshers throughout the semester. Well, just like you would have lab cleaning every year, you know, I do like a lab cleaning. Maybe every year you you talk to them about plagiarism and you remind them how serious it is and the reputation of the research group and the integrity of the research group. So I think just putting it out there, usually when I see things like this, I share it, the article or the news feed with my group so that they can see like you can get find, found out, like don't try it, don't find out the hard way. So I think if they know you're serious and they don't see you under stress for them to produce, rather you encourage them, Hey, you know what? Just go back, take your time, just redo it. It's okay. Sometimes I see my students and I ask them a question and they get nervous. And it's in that moment, you feel like they may not tell you the truth. How many times did you do it? And, and they're like hesitating and they're like, okay, I know it looks like they probably only did it once. And in that moment, you have to catch them. So sometimes you almost see their head spinning like, ah, oh, I didn't do it. Should I be honest and tell her I only did it once? And but I just encourage them, like, it's okay. If you did it once, just go back. We have time. Just go back and do it again. It's better to be safe than sorry. This is science. And I also reemphasize, this is research. You search and then you search again. So I think we just have to encourage them to do that. I love that definition. Yes, search and research again. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, I think we all come from our background, educational background, or, and sometimes it's also the environment that you kind of grew up with. It's Some people have different definitions of ethics and integrity, especially related to research. Some people are educated differently. Even where they came from, everybody is doing that. So they didn't think that was a problem. We have students like that or ourselves. I hope some listeners um, can benefit from it because we all have different bounds and rules that are instilled in us already when we start doing research or where we are now as a principal investigator. It, it's good to communicate that, I think, uh, rather than keep on believing what you've been doing uh, or where you have learned the, the definitions before, you just keep on applying the same way. I think it's very important to keep that communications open or just always talk to other people and to read other people's stories. The case where it was my, I really don't think my collaborator was doing it intentionally to hurt me in any way. I think they were just looking for a shortcut and they thought it was okay to do that shortcut. Um, so, and, you know, I think once they're being told that, you know, certain things are not okay, 
and this is how our ecosystem function, um, they might learn from it. They would say, oh, okay, I, I got it. And I would then never do it again. It's probably as easy as that. And it's much easier to deal with it early on and shared or being told by your friends and colleagues than actually being caught later <laughs> in a more serious uh, manner. We hope that we offered some good practices in order to avoid uh, plagiarism or fraud that's happening around you. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. You can follow us on Facebook and listen to our latest episodes on iTunes, Spotify, or Amazon Music. We'd like to thank our sponsor, the School of Engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute for sponsoring this episode. If you're interested in being a sponsor, then please contact us at sponsor at thisacademiclife.org. Join us next time for the good, the bad, and the ugly of this academic life.